One lone woman from the Maritimes lies buried with full military honors amongst the veterans of the American Civil War. She had fought in that war as a spy, as a soldier, and as a nurse, all while disguised as a man. Later, she'd fought a different kind of battle against the American government to successfully get her actions officially recognized through an act of Congress. Although her fellow soldiers knew her by her alias, Frank Thompson, her real name was Sarah Emma Edmonds. You're listening to Backyard History, the weekly newspaper column running across the Maritimes about the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard with your host and author, Andrew McLean. Lake Macadavic, about 25 miles northeast of Fredericton in the 1840s, was not exactly a bustling metropolis. Sarah Emma Edmonds, who went by Emma, was born into a meager farm, which was struggling even by the standards of the time. Her father had hoped for a son to help with the farm. Emma was the fifth child, and she had three sisters and a sickly brother who had epilepsy. As a child, Emma began to show an interest in what at the time were considered male pursuits. Farm work, shooting guns, hunting, horseback riding. While her mother encouraged these interests, she described her father as a domineering and abusive figure in her life who constantly put her down. Emma dreamed of a distinctly more adventurous life than could be found in Lake Magadavik. Something that she attributed to a life-changing book she was given at the age of nine by a traveling peddler, who told her that she reminded him of the book's main character. The book was called Fanny Campbell, Female Pirate Captain, A Tale of Revolution, and it was about the exploits of an assertive horse riding, gun shooting, cutlass waving girl from a small town in New England who disguised herself as a man and became a privateer during the American Revolution. The book was a work of fiction, but many young women who read it, like Emma, thought that it was a true story and looked up to its strong heroine. It was said that after its publication, sales of prints of women pirates became a phenomenon that were snapped up by young women who idolized what the character stood up for. By the time she was a teenager, Emma proudly boasted that she could outrun, she could outshoot, and she could outride any man in her region of New Brunswick. Around that time, she met a doctor in nearby Harvey, who encouraged her fascination with his job, and she took to following the doctor around as he worked on his patients. This doctor also encouraged Emma to attend to some of his patients himself, providing bedside assistance to the injured and the ailing. Around the time of her 17th birthday, Emma's life had been mapped out by her father. She was to marry a nearby farmer, and she was going to work as a hat maker. Emma, however, did not care at all for her father's plan for her future, and she described her would-be future husband as Quote, a lecherous old man. So abruptly, 17-year-old Sarah Emma Edmonds disappeared without a trace. A few days later, however, a man named Franklin Thompson mysteriously appeared in St. John, which was New Brunswick's largest city, and soon after, he took a job as a traveling bookseller. Emma had chopped her hair short tanned her face with stain and acquired men's clothing as her disguise and crafted an entirely new identity. Emma, in disguise as Frank Thompson, soon moved to the United States and worked as a traveling bookseller all over New England with a company based in Hartford called Hurlbut Company and became very successful at his job. Emma would later write in her 1865 autobiography 
nurse and spy in the Union Army. Frank Thompson later returned to New Brunswick, selling Bibles in the St. John River Valley. She had returned home to visit her family in disguise, in what would be the last time she ever set foot in New Brunswick. She knocked at the door of her childhood home in disguise on the pretext that she was interested in buying a horse her family was selling. Her father was out at the time, but her mother answered the door. Her mother invited this traveling salesperson in for something to eat and remarked that he looked an awful lot like her long lost daughter. Emma replied, mother, it's me. At first, her mother did not believe her because Frank Thompson was missing a distinctive mole that had been on Emma's cheek. The traveling salesperson took the mother's hand and guided it to her face, showing where the scar had been that Emma had cut off to better hide her identity. After this New Brunswick visit, Frank Thompson returned to selling books in the United States. Emma was living in Flint, Michigan, in this disguise still, when the American Civil War broke out. The American Civil War deeply affected Emma, as it did with many people from where she was from. Although Canada as a country would only come into being six years later, it's estimated that about 30,000 to 50,000 people from what we now call Canada volunteered to join this war. And virtually all of them were for the Union, which is to say the Northern or the anti-slavery side. This, however, masked sympathies in Canada, which were actually quite divided, with the looming talk of Canada being formed in the Maritimes in particular, the public shared a certain sympathy towards the Confederate States claim that they were a smaller power being pushed into uniting with a larger, more populous nation state. It should be noted, however, that this sympathy seems to have ended with slavery, an institution which Maritimers deeply disapproved of, and which referred to it as simply that peculiar institution. Emma, however, was very clear in her autobiography where her true loyalties lay. Like many Maritimers at the time, she was first and foremost a British subject, not an American. And she wrote frequently and actually rather angrily about gritting her teeth and biting her tongue when hearing Americans insult Britain. However, more than anything, Emma also wanted to end that peculiar institution which she listed as her main motivation when she tried to enlist in the Union Army in May 1861 in Flint, Michigan. Emma, as Frank Thompson, was rejected by the Army. She was not rejected by her disguise, but because of her height. At five foot six, she was too short to join the Army. However, very soon after, the Union side faced a desperate need to quickly raise a massive new army, and President Abraham Lincoln lowered the requirements to enlist. Suddenly, the standards were basically that so long as a recruit was not missing a limb, the recruiters, who were paid bonuses for each recruit they got, were more than happy to sign someone up. There was no requirements to strip down as part of the recruiting process. This is still the Victorian era, and that morality and that prudishness towards nudity was very much in vogue at the time, even in the army. So on May 25th, 1861, Emma successfully joined the Union Army, proudly emerging into the streets of Detroit as Private Frank Thompson, Company F, 2nd Michigan Volunteer Infantry Regiment, Pressured by the news of advancing Confederate armies, Emma and the rest of these new recruits in ill-fitting uniforms were told they would only receive a couple weeks of training before being sent into battle. So how was Emma able to disguise her gender during basic training? Well, this was the Victorian era and the prevailing culture of modesty 
even in the army, cannot be overemphasized in explaining how Emma was able to go undetected. Barracks of soldiers all slept fully clothed, and they bathed in full body undergarments at the time. Meanwhile, army bases had large open pits where soldiers were expected to use the washroom, but many of them avoided these foul smelling pits and would wander off into forests and streams to use the washroom. While fellow soldiers did not appear to suspect that Frank Thompson was secretly a woman, they did particularly mock Emma's small boot size. Despite this, she claimed in her autobiography that she fit in and she actually enjoyed her time in basic training. After a rudimentary basic training, however, owing to her youth spent shadowing the local country doctor in Harvey, New Brunswick, she was assigned to be a nurse. Nursing, at that time, was, in the army, considered to be a man's job. Though the new Union Army was not fully trained, due to public pressure for a quick victory, they were quickly sent into battle. Everyone expected a quick and decisive Union victory. So Emma went with her unit, joining up with some 34,000 thousand other Union soldiers to go into battle against roughly the same number of Confederate troops at the Battle of Bull Run. Emma described the scene in her autobiography. The regiments were drawn up in line, fully equipped for their journey, with their bright bayonets flashing in the morning sunlight. On looking back now upon the scenes of that morning, notwithstanding, I have looked upon others more thrilling since then. I cannot recall that hour without feelings of great emotion. Abraham Lincoln waited in Washington for news of the quick victory that day in battle, and his army's expected moves right afterwards to capture the Confederate capital. Instead, when President Lincoln received a telegram about the battle, it read, The day is lost. Army in full retreat. Save Washington and the remnants of this army. On the ground during this battle, Emma, in disguise, as always, was working in a makeshift field hospital in the ruins of a stone church. As she worked on the sick, the wounded and the dead bodies piled up around her. Emma wrote, The sight of that field is perfectly appalling, men tossing their arms wildly, calling for help. There they lie bleeding, torn, and mangled. Legs, arms, and bodies are crushed and broken, as if smitten by thunderbolts. The ground is crimson with blood. It is terrible to witness. Emma and her field hospital were forgotten in the chaotic retreat by the defeated army back to the capital. She had to catch up with them traveling alone in the night through what were now enemy lines. She wrote of crossing ditches of muddy roads piled high with dead bodies and horses, and smoke hung over everything as artillery shells continued to be fired at the broken and retreating Union Army as it fled back to the capital of Washington. When she made it back to Washington, she found the streets were filled with wounded soldiers, that there were troops wandering around looking for their units. There was inadequate food and medical supplies. And there were even angry mobs fighting with the soldiers, furious at them for losing the battle. That was just the first of many battles that Sarah Emma Edmonds wrote about participating in, in her autobiography. Over the course of the conflict, Emma moved out of nursing and into the United States' first ever intelligence gathering operation. At the time, that country had no intelligence apparatus and entrusted the famous detective Alan Pinkerton of the Pinkerton Detective Agency to build a spy service. So Emma, disguised as Frank Thompson, became highly skilled at keeping track of Confederate operations and became especially known for his remarkable ability to disguise as a woman. 
In these disguises, Emma was able to infiltrate high levels of Confederate military apparatus as, in various disguises, a peddler, a lady, a maid, and even a slave, relaying important information to the Union side. At one point, Emma encountered a fugitive slave and bought his clothes and assumed his identity of the slave named Cuff by wearing a wig and painting her skin with silver nitrate. She claimed to have managed to successfully infiltrate Confederate camps in this disguise, but that backfired at first as she was sent to do backbreaking physical labor with the other slaves. According to her autobiography, she eventually managed to exchange duties with another slave and got the role of bringing water buckets around the camp. This job allowed her to gather intelligence on the fortification and its armaments. She was able to escape with this valuable information and relay it to the Union side. Emma's service in the war came to an abrupt end when she became ill with malaria. After spending three days in a swamp trying to make her way back to Union lines after gathering intelligence in the Confederate capital while dressed as an Irish peddler named Bridget O'Shea. Requiring treatment and fearing that her secret would be discovered if she went to a military hospital, she disappeared and went to a civilian hospital. After recovering more than a week later, she was returning to her military base when she spotted posters. Franklin Thompson was wanted for desertion. The punishment for desertion was death. So Emma dropped the dual identity and resumed her previous life as Sarah Emma Edmonds. After the war's end, however, she was certainly never shy about her experiences. Rather than hide her secret life, she wrote a book about it called Nurse and Spy in the Union Army in 1865. It became a bestseller, selling a remarkable 175,000 copies. She donated all the money she received off of it to organizations that helped wounded veterans. Her autobiography makes for an unconventional read today. Um, it's written in a Victorian style, which modern readers would probably find pretty dramatic. Um, like what I mean by that is that there's an awful lot of deathbed confessions and late life conversions to Christianity. Parts of it have been questioned by historians, uh, notably the spy sections, and Emma herself admitted that parts of the story were told out of order to allow the book to flow better, but she insisted the fundamentals of her story were true. After the war, Emma met up with an old friend from St. John, New Brunswick, who also now lived in the United States. He was a lumber surveyor and a mechanic named Linus Seeley. They ended up getting married and they settled in Texas. Together they had three children, all sons, who died in infancy. They adopted two more sons, who Emma later proudly claimed joined the army just like their mother. All was not well with Emma, however. As a result of her time in the war and her sickness, she had several lingering injuries and was in generally poor health, and she lived in poverty. In 1882, she began the long and difficult bureaucratic process to get her time in the army recognized and receive her pension. As part of the process, she contacted the soldiers with whom she had once served. She claimed that they were shocked to learn that Frank Thompson had secretly been a woman. Her fellow soldiers, however, did not appear to hold this against her, and they assisted her in what would become a six-year-long fight for official recognition. They helped her by attesting to her service and they, in turn, actually became outspoken supporters for her in her quest for the pension she had earned. 
The government bureaucracy was unsure what to do with such an unusual case. Emma and her supporters lobbied the United States Senate for four years to recognize her contributions in the war and to award her her pension. Eventually, they were successful, and the Senate passed a bill to uniquely recognize her deeds as a woman in disguise, fighting in the war officially. However, there was now another problem. Her alter ego was still wanted for desertion and treason. It took another two years of lobbying before the House of Representatives passed another bill to dismiss the treason charges against her. So after six years of fighting, Emma finally received her military pension. It was $12 a month. She was the only woman to receive a pension for fighting in the American Civil War. This is not to say, however, that Emma was the only woman who disguised herself to fight in that war. According to historian Elizabeth D. Leonard, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 women had fought in the American Civil War while disguised as men. Sarah Emma Edmonds, however, stands out for writing a best-selling book about her experiences and for fighting a long battle against the U.S. government for recognition and the pension she had earned. Her battle with the government for her pension sparked a fair amount of interest in her and during and after she became a popular lecturer hired to speak all around the United States. This finally offered her some of the financial security that she had long lacked. Sarah Emma Edmonds died on September 5th, 1898, at the age of only 56. It is thought that the long complications of her wartime injuries were her cause of death. She received a military funeral and was mustered into the Grand Army of the Republic, a Civil War Veterans Association, and she was the only woman ever to receive this honor. At the insistence of the group's members, she was buried at the Grand Army of the Republic Cemetery in Washington, D.C. She is the only woman to be buried there. That was another episode of Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Stay tuned for next week's episode for another hidden story that happened right in your own backyard. <laughs>